So data, math, and methods. <coughs> what is this class even about? Uh, so data, that means data sciences, that means what I'm doing in research. Uh, math, that means mathematics. Uh, methods, that's like algorithms, and then all of it should somehow uh, also be related with art, because we are here. And so like logically, all of this basically belongs into the category of creative computing, which is what this place is about. So. Let's let's throw all of these things together. Uh, the practical parts. Uh, is it Wednesday? It is Wednesday. Uh, it will happen here, and uh, usually there will be two pauses, like uh, like in the previous classes. Uh, in the for the marking, uh, I will look at the attendance. Obviously, uh, there will be a practical exam, and then some multiple choice test. Uh, and I have no idea what will be there yet. We will have to like I will have to work on it, and then uh, some somewhere during the year I will tell you how this works. Uh, and I will try to be recording this, as I was saying, and maybe put it somewhere. And then uh, we will have a repository, so something similar to what we had before, um, where you will be able to look up the slides. Uh, hopefully, like one day before, maybe, yeah. I will try to put like even just the basic version there, and maybe it will get updated a little bit. But yeah, so uh, you have this link in all of your Moodle pages and everywhere, and I will also be sending it later if there are some homeworks. And then this is something that you have seen before, and the slides are also here as PDF, so nothing really out of the ordinary. Uh, okay. Data, maths, and methods. Uh, let's start with the maths part. Uh, so what is math about? Very generally and very conceptually thinking, this is a very complicated world that we live in. All of this uh, is often confusing to us, this, the, the physical realm, and all of the, I don't know, relationships happening between people, all of the social interaction, all of your own psychology is happening, and uh, all of those things are really like, complicated, right? So people are trying to use some systems and something to describe these uh, concepts. Or also uh, like biology. There is infinite amount of complicated stuff happening in our own bodies and we don't really know it, how it all works, but we have some theories. We have like a science uh, framework that we apply on it and then that works to some degree and then maybe it doesn't and then we have to make a new framework, etc. And maybe there is a framework which works on like the uh, organs uh, level, and then there is another one which works on the cellular level, so some stuff which happens like in one cell communicating with the other one, but that particular framework is completely useless when you are talking about something bigger as organisms and their interaction, something like that. So this is all complicated world and science trying to kind of explain it uh, and describe it. And so math is something similar. It's an abstraction of like a really messy reality into a perfect world that we can think in. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's consisting of numbers, of some rules. Uh, we often have some problem that we, like, there's a problem that we describe in the maths world and then we can twist it, work with it, try to rephrase it and eventually have like some really clean solution at the end and then we will see that, oh yeah, it actually doesn't work because this is just like very abstract and uh, it will have to link into the reality again. So uh, that's what would math be about. Uh, it is often well defined, right? We have some uh, exact definitions of things we are working with. Uh, we will see this in the next class where we will start defining some like basic uh, uh, stuff that we will be working with. But there is also space to, to describe some chaotic or random uh, or stochastic behavior, so some, something with statistics, where we don't know how it will work out exactly all the time, but we have some like how it works usually, some uh, experiments. Cool. And also, uh, there are problems we, which we can describe uh, precisely. So, with some analytical solution, we will, uh, and I don't actually know. A good example of that, but there, yeah, the the universe or the, how the planets move. We are trying to describe that, and we are not able to really describe it uh, with analytical, uh, like precise formulas because we don't know 
or there were attempts like that, like Newtonian physics was an attempt to describe how planets move, but then, then came uh, relativity and uh, it turns out that uh, time and uh, matter is interlinked somehow, so the previous models didn't work, so the newer ones included this, etc. So often we don't care about that, we care about uh, if the model that we have is good enough. Right. So all of this is kind of seeping through the math realm. Okay. Uh, and now, uh, they did not, now the following will be the photos from my uh, holidays in Sri Lanka. <laughs> uh, the, the, he, these are some, not really, but it will be fun, but not really. Uh, these are some examples of kind of like mathematical things happening in the real world. Uh, so there is a plant on the left which uh, is just amazing because it follows some uh, inherent rules to the plant. Probably it's just given by the way how uh, how it grows, and so it grows, and then there is a rule saying split at this moment, it will split and make a leaf. And then the same rule applies here, make a leaf and split, and then make a leaf and split, and it uh, oh, oops. it will make this kind of like a, a recursive thing happening, or like kind of, you could describe it mathematically, right? Uh, there is a whole family of plants who which have these uh, these shapes, uh, or yeah, I don't know the, the right one. I just like how it looks, but uh, I think there is also some kind of description of uh, of this. And so uh, this is given by how the plants grow up, and so there is some inherent rule in there. We don't know how it works. We can, in our profession, we can make some like simulation which will make these trees and stuff like this look like it, but. Yeah, uh, well, that's it. Uh, so quite often in architecture, there is a uh, visible influence of uh, some uh, mathematical idea into the real world. So there is some kind of like lotus pond and it's just kind of like quite beautiful and it's given by sp spherical, uh, just, just, I don't know, eight spheres and then increasing size and that's it, it's super easy. and it makes like nice buildings uh, and these concepts of uh, some mathematical thinking I, I, I guess you would know about golden ratio so the one-third to two-third if you are making a picture it's ideal to, uh, to plant uh, to, to place the thing that you are shooting in the one to third uh, ratio so you see enough background etc and so this is again some rule that's maybe coming from us but maybe it's kind of in our uh, aesthetics uh, and I, I uh, saw this uh, Buddha statue in a museum and uh, usually you just see them in, in temples and there are many of them and uh, they are interesting and, and nice. It, it's a, like there's a lot of culture behind it, but there is actually like a mathematical formulation of uh, how the perfect body of the awakened should be. And this is some, uh, yeah, there is some basically mathematical description of, okay, there is a half, and this line, then there is a, I don't even know, like probably thir three thirds, and this is split again. But yeah, this is just to show that maybe there is, in different cultures, there might be different uh, ideal compositions. But anyway, even Buddha is math. Uh, okay, so going onwards, uh, methods, the next part of the, of the class. Uh, Basically, for me, what that means is algorithms, which is solutions how to solve some problems, uh, which is basically steps of solving something. So, I don't know, even in like, in, in Tetris, uh, you want to fill something and, and there is a solution of like, you are filling box together to get from here to somewhere here and to fill the, play, the whole place. And how you, you describe this process is using some algorithm. Uh, yeah, and so even very simple rules uh, uh, can lead into way more complex behavior in the end if, if these rules are kind of maybe simulated on larger scale. So there is an example of Game of Life. Have you ever heard of Game of Life? Conway's Game of Life? All right, cool. Uh, I'll be the first one to show you show this then uh, to you. So Conway's Game of Life is a simple. Uh, Simple game, uh, which happens on a grid, and these are sort of the situations. Uh, you have a generation of uh, dead or alive cells, 
every cell in a grid is either dead or alive, zero or one, uh, white or black, I don't know, it depends on how you are showing it. And uh, to get from one frame of this generation to the next one, there is like a very simple rule. If around the cell that uh, has already some uh, life in there, there is not uh, just uh, yeah, less than two population around it, so, so just one alive cell around it, or no cell alive cell, it will die. So the next frame will be dead. If there is two or three, it will stay alive. If there is too much, it means uh, it's overcrowded and it will die again. Uh, and then if it's uh, exactly three, it will reproduce and on this cell there will be life again. And so this really basic rule happens on every of these uh, squares in the grid. And you have basically animation of saying one, one state of the game, second state of the game, second state of the game. And uh, so there are these kind of, uh, yeah, I will just show this because there is a nice visualization of what happens when you, when you start it is that there is, from these like four very simple rules, there is more complicated stuff happening. So there are uh, these square two by two blocks, they never die because every one of them has three siblings. So it will survive, and this one as well, and this one as well, and this one as well, so well. So this is kind of like representing a stable part of the uh, life in this way. Then there are these guns and gliders and sliders, which are some, for example, this one is a slider which will always move to the right down. From these basic rules, this is what happens. So there is like almost intelligent like behavior in, in a basic stuff. And yeah. Uh, you can describe these smaller blocks together, so block would be this. I think there is one oscillator or something, which just, it's a shape that just changes and changes and changes and changes. There are two states to it and it just changes forever. And the fun part is that, yeah, let's watch this video. Uh, so this is the animation. <laughs> and so with these rules you can describe more complicated systems, right? So if you zoom out sort of, you see the behavior in, in larger scale. And there are some crazy people who made Conway's Game of Life inside the Conway's uh, Game of Life. So as we get larger and larger from the, from the small individual cells, there are some macro cells which are then uh, either alive or dead. So this is a dead cell, this is a alive cell, even though inside of it there are small uh, cells th themselves. And so, I think this will just zoom out. And I will let it play out. Uh, so, that's the example of like a micro scale life happening there and then uh, macro scale something else happening as well. And so I think when they will scale out, you will see another yeah, and now this it's iterating one frame by frame in the macro scale of it. So it's again moving. So you could make another uh, Conway Game of Life behind it as well and forever basically. And all of this is coming from just the four simple, uh, four, four simple uh, rules that we saw before. I don't know what that was. So basically, the cell dies or it, uh, it, it survives, and that's it. And from, from these basic rules, there comes a very complicated behavior uh, from it. Uh, I think I have seen uh, some examples of this being used in some like artworks somewhere, because you can code this quite easily and then just let it play out. You can have someone draw into it and then see what happens and it just will play out like as well. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, so there is no equation, I think, or maybe actually, yeah. You could say that cell, whatever, whatever. You could write it as a code. So you could say, if around, like count how many things are alive around it. If it's equal to less than two, then die. If it's equal to more than three, then die. 
etc. Yeah. So, so you could definitely write it as code. Maybe there is some elegant formula as well. I don't know. Cool. So uh, this is uh, continuing uh, in the methods part. Uh, so, all right. Next part is kind of like if you have simple rules and then they build up into something more complex, you can have entire simulated worlds, so some sort of simulator, which is just uh, having some simple rules, for example, gravity, which is bringing everything down, right, in the world that you have, and maybe some interactions, uh, like if you move with something, that it will push you away from the surface or something. And so there is a famous work by Carl Sims. Have you heard about Carl Sims? Cool, okay new things to show them, uh, which is uh, using so-called genetic algorithms uh, to uh, teach beings or virtual creatures inside the simulated wor world to walk or to swim or to do some things. Uh, so this is from 1994. Uh, what the genetic algorithms are is that you have some simulated world and then you have you, you, you generate many random initial beings and then you see how they do. You select the ones that do well and then you cross over them. So it's, simulate, it's something like an evolution, evolutionary algorithm, genetic algorithm. You will cross over them and make new individuals from these older ones. And over a long time, you will get individuals who are really good at their job. Uh, and so it's best to just show it. And I think there is a guy speaking into this, so it's... This demonstration shows virtual creatures that were evolved to perform specific tasks in simulated physical environments. Swimming speed was used to determine so survival. It's some Most of the creatures like are results from independent evolutions. The world, some developed strategies some similar to those in they, real life. Like what if they Once they're evolved, Multiple copies of these creatures can be made and simulated. And so this is sort of like, it, you, you started with nothing and like really messy behavior and then merging them together, selecting the well-doing individuals, the individuals with high fitness, uh, you get something like this, you, you get emergent behavior. Uh, you, have, you have had to sell, like, define uh, what is the fitness function. So, so in this case they said, Okay, how far you walk is the fitness, and then just evolve. And so they had to just use some game environment and then define this one function which rewards or punishes the, the creatures and then just have it run and it will just do whatever. It will just make these strange beings. And so there is like, it's interesting idea. I just recently saw Terminator, uh, the last one. <laughs> and so it's interesting idea of like, you could send a autonomous robot somewhere on a some planet and it could survive, generate new individuals there, see how well they are doing and like generation after generation have them perfect themselves and maybe adapt to whatever unknown uh, stuff is happening there. Uh, which is a bit strange but like uh, yeah. So yeah, so th this would be, uh, I think in this case they were, uh, they are able to like follow like the, the, the fitness function here was to follow a, a dot or something, or a location. Uh, and there is, I was really uh, interested in this when I was working on my bachelor thesis, so I did my bachelor thesis on virtual creatures. And so there is just a similar video with a, with a freeware software called Framsticks, which uh, allows you to do this basically quite easily. So I don't know. This was many years ago, how many, I don't know, <laughs> some years ago. Uh, and so I don't know it, how, how much the software got uh, evolved from there, but uh, you can, again, like evolving them, you can get different behaviors. So you can get creatures who are pulling them, themselves in to, to get moving, or they are rolling, so sort of like jumping with their body. And this is something I have not coded for, for the, for the uh, creatures that are there. I coded just the function and uh, had this simulated uh, environment. 
And so each stick is like part of the animal and then they can have a joint, meaning they can be able to like move the, the things together. And so some are quite really messy. I think there is one even where, yeah, so it's like pushing and, or pulling, I don't know. And the next one is spinning. But I think actually this was a, an error of the simulator because it's spinning and there is no joint in this. So it's just, I think it found some kind of mistake in the simulation and just started like using that to, to, to still move. Uh, which I don't know, it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting and it's an example of, of sort of, uh, of the methods. And, and uh, there is a third example of the same thing basically, but because I like dinosaurs and they made dinosaurs move. Uh, I will just show it as a demo. So they are able to teach a humanoid, fine, that's good. Uh, let's see, here. And this applies to, oh, no, no, no. There are some methods how they used it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so the later generations are much better at it. The, the earlier ones are, they have some like solution for a bit, but then not, not really for long. So the generation one shows the initialization it's all random, they don't know. And the, the later one is, is like, okay, how do you teach, uh, if you have a body, uh, how would you teach how it should behave? So there is some neural network controlling these. So you have silly looking uh, dinosaurs moving. I think there is a example when they are throwing blocks at the dinosaur, just to see if, if it still moves, like in a robust environment. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> And there is uh, like work from, uh, there is a, I don't know what's the name of it now, uh, an evil American corporation doing it, uh, the, the, having robots that move really, like that, that, can, that they have a robot that can jump like somersault from a box into another box. It's crazy stuff and like maybe they have something similar, maybe not, uh, but yeah. Okay, uh, all of this was methods. So sort of different types of algorithms. I think we will maybe talk about some of them. Uh, as I was saying, there is no kind of like very specific outline to this class. I think I have to reach some point where you know some things from maths. But uh, if there is something quite interesting that, that you find interesting and you want me to talk about it in more detail, tell me and I will spend more time on it. And uh, the last part uh, to this class is the d data. So what is data? Data is information, so theoretically, absolutely anything more interesting than noise. Uh, so you measure signals from the space, that's data. You measure uh, how people move in, a, in an environment, that's data. You measure how people send images to each other, image is a data, uh, all of that. So why do you care? It's kind of like anything can be described as data, so it's a bit boring maybe. Uh, data is just data, and data for the sake of data is, 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 is nonsense. Uh, but uh, if you have large quantities of it, uh, aka the term that was famous in some years ago, big data, and you have some smart methods and algorithms, uh, for example machine learning, uh, you can then train on this data and have, have some predictions from what you have seen how it's happening, be, uh, behaving before, you can predict into the future of how it will behave later. Uh, a huge part of, uh, of this is data visualization. I will not talk about it at all in this first part and maybe get into it later. But uh, th that's a huge part as well. And again, a huge part is if you have some data to model some behavior in there, learn to understand what's happening and maybe even generate something new. And, and the generating part is kind of touching into our uh, region more. And then arts. <laughs> so all of this is kind of, uh, I, I will be trying to kind of just connect it to arts and this is kind of just a very maybe naive thinking about arts. What is arts? Well, like exploring of the unknown, no? That, that's, the, that's what we are trying to do, maybe. Uh, you would display something, show a thing to another person, uh, show two things and compare them, maybe critique something. Uh, there is a lot of self-reference, self-self-reference, self-self-self, etc. Uh, provocation, joke, just 
the, the pure creativity and everything, right? Uh, all of these things. I don't know the definition. How would you define art? Anyway, uh, and I guess one part I was trying to like pick something uh, which I will get later to, but I think it's the kind of trying to portray complexity or messiness of something. Uh, you see something happening in this messy world and you want to show it in the complex picture. You don't want to really cut out a lot of things and just show some simplification of it. You want to say, see, hey, this is all happening. It's all complicated. There is no really easy way how to talk about it. Maybe. And what about sciences or science? Well, I think as a, as a, as a scientist as well, it is about exploration of the unknown as well. So you are trying to describe something that you don't know how it works with something. Uh, and why I made these two things bold, I am trying to kind of maybe uh, distinguish what is the difference. So maybe science is sometimes trying to uh, describe something in a very clear way, in a very explainable way. Whereas with arts, maybe you are trying to actually show the complicatedness of the thing, and you don't want to uh, reduce it. But actually, for science to work well, you have to include all the complicatedness as well, and also for the arts to work well, you have to have them explainable as well. So it's kind of like, anyway. Uh, so why uh, science and arts and exploration of the unknown? I think kind of the arts, sci art, science, or sci art, I don't know, will kind of be the link throughout this whole class. Uh, because all of the topics are kind of fitting into these two categories. You, mathematics or maths is typically put into uh, sciences part, the, the uh, hardcore co courses the, or something, and then the arts are maybe some, I don't know, these distinctions exist, but, right? But with, uh, this class should kind of combine it, so we are interested in the space in between somehow, maybe. Yeah, cool. And uh, so, There is a lot of interaction, right, between sciences and arts. And some people really stand in one category and are very strict about it and say, okay, get, get out all the science from my face or get out all the arts from my face. I don't care at all. I'm a scientist or I'm an artist. And I, yeah, but it's, uh, it's boring a bit, maybe. So there is a lot of influence coming from one to another. Uh, so from the direction of science into arts, uh, I think the whole modernism, uh, where you are moving from some like realistic representation of something into more abstracted forms, that's quite heavily influenced by some scientific uh, approaches. I think in the uh, 20th century there was a philosophical uh, thinking in systems as a concept that came into a lot of sciences. So it's, we are instead of just measuring things and trying to work out hey, how it works, you, you start writing systems that will kind of describe the behavior of the thing. And uh, so uh, in arts also you can write a system and that will be the thing that uh, will make you make these photographs or something. That's a concept then, and then you are following the concept to make the stuff. And sometimes you have to show, like talk about the concept more than what you have actually made as pictures maybe. And from arts to sciences, uh, I guess uh, I guess one, one could be even questioning. You could kind of uh, sciences can be quite harsh in doing something that is maybe wrong. <laughs> and and so so uh, as as a good scientist, you actually should co uh, question that as well. But maybe with, with the help of this, it's it's. Could be done as well with the help of arts. Uh, there is a lot of like illustration of some scientific uh, idea through arts. Uh, yeah, being able to portray something in its complicatedness, in its complicatedness, rather than just dissect it into uh, some small rules that are boring in the end because they don't apply to the reality. And okay. Uh, yeah, there are some more examples, uh, and soon we will have a pause. Uh, the first example is like Johannes Vermeer. Uh, probably you know all of yeah. yeah. There is uh, the whole 
period of kind of realism where every painter is trying to portray the light as best they can. So it all looks kind of very realistic and, and so I think the, the, the golden uh, standard in that time is kind of like if you get it as realistic as possible, that's the best you can do. And then there come different theories which are kind of like, okay, realism is fine, but it's a bit boring. So how could we like, how can we move art somewhere else? So you start having some like playing around with it, maybe abstracting it, right? So pointillism, uh, not painting with, with the exact brush strokes, so everything looks very real, but kind of just dissecting into the blobs, right, points. And then uh, if you look too close, then you see the points, but if you go far away, it, it kind of makes the picture as well. And also this is, uh, it's not realistic, right? It, it's, uh, it's abstracted, all of this. And there are many more examples, I'm just showing some simple ones basically uh, and, and also because I'm coming from a photographical background I will put these uh, photographs somewhere through these slides as well uh, there is a guy called Joseph Albers I don't know if you know uh, him uh, I think it's actually a couple of Albers, Albers is, uh, it, it's a couple who were painters and also I think mostly painters and there is a so 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 his stuff is sort of this paintings, very like abstract shapes, uh, squares, uh, nice geometrical compositions, colors, and everything. But uh, from his journals from Mexico, he's, he was kind of traveling through these uh, uh, ancient ruins and kind of maybe looking at the uh, patterns happening there and kind of trying to get inspired by them and, and then convert them into a abstracted form. Uh, and even these, you could say, are somewhere, somewhere, somehow inspired by maybe some plants or something, and they abstracted it into these like lines. And this guy came and then abstracted it more. And he ended up basically working with these. He has many of these squares as his final work, where he is just drawing squares at the end, I think, homage to the square. And he is playing around with the colors. He's playing around with the maybe where the squares are a little bit, but it's all really like, if, if, you, if you look just at this, you're like, okay, what's, what's happening with this guy? It, it squares, it's like, what? <laughs> uh, but, but it's kind of going from reality or from realism into abstract and even more, even more, even more, even more until you end up in the kind of the most abstract thing you can do, the square. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, and so something similar happened in photography, uh, where the the first photograph uh, there there are some uh, history of photography. There are some more complicated stuff happening, uh, but I think the first photograph that is usually mentioned is this one, a view from the window at La Grasse. Uh, I think it was the first one that uh, uh, Nicephor Nieps was able to stabilize, so it remained. Uh, so the whole concept behind this was to figure out the science of fixing the image and even like working out the, the plate or whatever this was to catch the image for later and then to fi fix it. So the whole idea there was basically to be as real as possible uh, and to be kind of as precise as possible to the thing that you are showing to the camera. And so this is the history. I mean, like we have phones and, and we are able to make pictures with, with anything sort of now. So it's, uh, it went really far from there. But uh, these are the beginnings. And not, not too long after this, I actually some, somewhat long, there is a photographer called DJ Ruzička, and I'm not picking him because uh, he's my name, uh, he has my name only because of that. But he's a, a pictorialist photograph uh, who is trying to like, so, so, so you are, you're shooting reality, right? When you are shooting with a camera, you can, just do, like to some amount, you were, uh, to some time, you, you were just shooting reality, right? What's the art in there, maybe, is the question. Like, is, is photography actually art? You're just copying whatever exists. And so, of course, it is art because you're choosing the frame and then you're playing around with that as well. But this was an attempt to kind of, it's not just reality in this case, it's reality, and then there is some, like quite a lot of emotion there, no? some sort of like romantic light happening in the Penn Station in New York. This is working not just as, and the, the people you are not really, you don't see them as their faces, but it's kind of like a feeling of the place. So yeah. Uh, and then you can get 
for uh, even more distant from there, uh, as I was saying, the, the, this is conceptual photography. So this guy at Russia, uh, uh, this whole pro project is to shoot 26 gasoline stations. So he took a camera and just drive, drove, and then whenever he found the station, he just made the picture of it and then showed this kind of se selection of 26 photographs. The one individual photograph in this, it doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a shitty gas station, maybe. But this concept of like coming up with a plan and then kind of executing it as a machine, sort of, uh, and then showing whatever is the result is, is kind of... Uh, it's not reality anymore, sort of. It's more about the concept at that point. And maybe showing that, that there is a lot of repetition in these buildings. And maybe showing that, I don't know, if we live in this environment, it, they are ugly buildings, maybe. Or they are beautiful buildings as well, uh, to some degree. But like, if we, if we would live in these environments over and over again, we would maybe go mad, because these are some just bricks and squares and... Yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, and there is a lot of more examples of in, in photography, and I will probably smuggle some pictures in these classes as well. But uh, this is more or less it for this section. Right, so right now, let's have a pause. Uh, I have no idea what the time. So let's have until 15, maybe, for the next part. OK. Uh, so back to the class. Uh, we will start with uh, listening to the to a, st uh, to a section from a podcast, and that podcast is something from a Royal Academy of, of something. I think uh, they have some talk sessions or something, and they had a one where there was a uh, RA Royal Academy of Arts, and they had one where they were talking. Uh, a mathematician doing arts and artist doing maths somehow and uh, they had just a discussion between the two of them and it was kind of interesting to listen to it so uh, and the, the podcast itself is like 15 minutes or something so uh, I, I cut up some segments which were kind of interesting maybe before the mathematician got into too much details about his math and the artist too much details about his arts and kind of like just the start of their descriptions and it's kind of interesting to see what they are talking about and I thought it might be something worth checking out in this class as well. Uh, I hope this, this speaker will be um, enough for it and uh, you are welcome to listen to the rest of the uh, the podcast later as well but I still wanted to kind of listen to the first section together somewhere if I find it. Mm. Jesus. I don't have it. Uh, yes, so. Conrad Shawcross, the artist and sculptor, author of Psychogeometries, whose works combine his fascinations with geometry and philosophy. Sounds good. Or more? The from the highway for cars driving into the Blackpool Tunnel. Uh, a work of art had its place in a new community that was being built. Um, Marcus Dusotoy is a well-known mathematician and crucially a public communicator at maths too, and author of the Creativity Code, whose work with mathematical shapes in multiple dimensions seems very much to take us into a world closer to art and imagination than the maths most of us might have engaged with in our daily lives or at school. I want to be very much led by uh, both of you. Certainly I love the idea in your book, Marcus, of maths as painting with ideas. So I thought perhaps to start off, Marcus first and then Conrad, you've got some visual images and, and to get, get us thinking about where yeah, and like art meet. Bollocks at the start. Yes, well, I suppose um, I partly wrote this book about the creativity code um, because I wanted to try and convince myself that I couldn't be put out of a job as a mathematician uh, by code because what I do is highly creative and involves a lot of aesthetics, emotion, and choice and things which I've always felt had a close connection with uh, what drives an artist. Um, 
there's clearly lots of connections between maths and music, but um, whenever I've been to Conrad's exhibitions, I, I've always felt we seem to be interested in very similar things. And I went around to, uh, we live very close to each other in, in uh, East London, and so I went around to his studio and it just looked like a kind of a, uh, mathematician's laboratory. Um, and I could see he was totally obsessed with very similar thought of things that I've been obsessed with and actually humans have been obsessed with for years, which is the idea of uh, symmetry and what you can make out of things that are symmetrical. That's what my research is about. So I thought I'd just start by laying a little foundation. You probably uh, were in a kind of art space, probably have seen some of Conrad's pieces, but you may not have seen some of my pieces. So I wanted to give you a little feel for uh, one of the challenges, you can't see my pieces, but it all began with actually the ability to see things. And uh, we've been obsessed with making some objects for, for many years, so this dates back uh, 5,000 years, um, Neolithic stones found in Scotland where an artist is exploring the possibilities of symmetry. But actually it's the mathematician who then uh, looked at what the limitations of symmetry are, and we find in the first great textbook of all time, Euclid's Elements, a proof that there are only five solids called the platonic solids that you can make, uh, at where all, each of the faces is a symmetrical face. These are essentially the dice that you have in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, uh, one in particular is really very important to a connection between what Conrad and I are fascinated in, which is the simplest of the symmetrical shapes, which is the tetrahedron. This is made out of four equilateral triangles um, the ancient Greeks believed this was the building blocks of the natural world, these shapes, and uh, the, the tetrahedron corresponded to fire, that you could make the whole of the universe out of symmetry. In a sense, we understand that that's kind of true, because symmetry is the, the heart of fundamental particles, diamond is strong because of the tetrahedron. Um, but I think it's interesting that you see this dynamic between the artist and the scientist exploring what's possible in symmetry. So again, one of my favorite places in the whole of the world, if I was banished, I'd love to live in the Alhambra in Granada, because that's a place where the 13th, 14th century artists were exploring what's possible on walls. Um, and but it took until the end of the 19th century for mathematicians to come up with a language to explore symmetry. And it was a language not of the visual, but of the kind of linguistic and algebraic, which showed us that there are actually only 17 different sort of symmetries you can make on the wall in the Alhambra. And this language actually gave us the ability to understand that we, as mathematicians, could classify symmetry and show that there are actually building blocks, like the ancient Greeks thought there were building blocks of matter, um, so we understood that there are kind of atomic symmetries, something a bit like the periodic table in chemistry. That's all the atoms which build molecules. We understood that you could actually classify the building blocks of symmetry. Okay, cutting off the first one because... So, you meant... uh, Marcus was just elaborating on the platonic solids. So this one of the things that has been an incredibly sort of um, kind of uh, amazing friend to me or just this amazing kind of um, rich source of investigation for me and just keeps on giving in terms of kind of ideas or, or beguiling properties is the tetrahedron which is as you said is the simplest of the platonic solids. I, I learned about the platonic solids at school and I was told there were five of them and they all had the same number of faces on the outside but it was when I revisited them or someone defined them in a different way to me that they suddenly became extraordinarily interesting to me and that they are well, they, I was never told why there were five, and because there are lots of polygons and different forms, but they are the only ways you can divide the surface up of a sphere up equally. So if you imagine these, those shapes that, um, that Marcus had up, you imagine inflating them uh, like a football or a balloon, they would form perfect spheres. So it's like, um, uh, that, that, that's one of them. So it's a really interesting thing that a sphere can only be broken up equally five ways. So it's a... Um, something that really sort of got me thinking. So there's a radiant symmetry to them, which I've used in lots of different ways, but it was suddenly in the way that it was defined, they suddenly became something incredibly different to me. And I'm interested not from, from a mathematical point of view, but also a philosophical point of view. The tetrahedron was the symbol of the atom in Greek uh, mythology and Greek uh, philosophy. It's the indivisible unit of matter. And the atom to us now is, is quite misleading. It's in, in a way, it's a bit like Pluto. It should be uh, it should be withdrawn, the name atom, because it was very eagerly, it's an example of scientists being too eager at a certain point and coin, using this, this ancient word 
and coining something which they believed to be the indivisible matter, but within a generation, the atom had been divided into the quark and the electron, and so it should have been um, retracted. So it should have been the particle formerly known as. as uh, <laughs> but um, but it's, uh, we can refer to it now as that, if you want to. But um, So I, I, was, that, I was interested in trying to use the tetrahedron as a building block, and I thought, very naively, I, and quite kind of cavalierly, I made 800 tetrahedrons, and uh, I thought I had two weeks to put them together in a garden, and I thought, I'll find the rules and the logics of this thing, and work, and then I'll be able to sculpt what I want out of it. But it was very, it was very uh, irrelevant and sort of um, irreverent, and, and just formed its own rules. And I couldn't, I couldn't channel it or or or, or kind of carve or carve it, so to speak, or control it. It was very unruly, and it doesn't tessellate with itself. So it formed these tendril-like, fire-like things. So it just basically made itself. So again, this thing, which I think we'll come on to later about. The, this idea of discovery and invention. I was trying to invent something, but it was really sort of just forming itself, and I had no sort of control over it. But I was also interested in this idea of radiance and entropy and expansion, the idea of space and time, and trying to convey complex ideas, but visually. So I think, again, like with your symmetry thing, is interesting in that it only that represents in numbers, but it's, it's, in, it's impossible to represent it visually. And I'm trying to sort of represent abstract ideas that will never be seen by our eyes, um, kind of visually. So trying to sort of create sort of models or metaphors. Ah, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> uh, right. So, I think like both of them at some point, point started buffling about their own stuff and so it got a little bit lost, but then uh, I chose this part because then they kind of got back into some interesting idea that they wanted to explore. So one would be the symmetry, uh, and they were talking about radial symmetry. That means that there is one point and then everything is symmetrical on that point. And like you, you could see that in a lot of arts, I think, uh, or art things. And uh, second part was kind of like talking about uh, divisibility of matter. So we have a theory that there are atoms and then Okay, it got expanded that they are not just atoms, but they are subatomic sub particles, quarks, stuff like this. And maybe in some few years we will discover that it's even more divisible, etc. But and it, that's kind of interesting because, uh, uh, I don't know, there is this like analog and digital. Digital is something which can be divided into some amount of bits, zeros and ones. And analog maybe is something that cannot be divided there. No matter how much you zoom, you can always see some like different gradient, right? And we, we think about our real world that hey, this is probably uh, analog. This is kind of like real, not divisible, but maybe it's not. So yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Regardless of, of, of what we think about uh, what they were saying, it is interesting when they start talking because you can see that they are living inside their own field and then try, kind of trying to understand the other field sort of and maybe get out from there. Uh, one of them is working with uh, mathematical formulations. So basically he's writing some papers where it's just paper full of formulas and he's playing with the formulas, moving some things around and then getting some other formula and then that proves something. While the other one is kind of like building these uh, objects out of something and then really like visually doing it. And, and so so this, this different thinking about maybe the same thing is kind of interesting. But yeah. Uh, so th this, this would be the start, the first part. And then now there is the task for today. And the task is for you guys to play uh, either a game of chess or a game of Go or a game of or prisoners, prisoner's Dilemma. Have you uh, heard about Prisoner's Dilemma? Anyone? Okay, good. Uh, do you know Prisoner's Dilemma? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, okay, yeah, so possibly the easiest ones are uh, chess and go. And what uh, connects all of these games is that they are so-called zero-sum game because it's two players playing the same game and either one of them wins or the other one wins. Or there is a stalemate in some cases, right? But like. It's that they are competing with the same, like, them winning means the other one losing, which is a strange thing, because in real life it doesn't work like this sometimes, right? Uh, yeah, but anyway, so, so uh, 
games, board games, computer games, uh, they make us think in some way. This is different to how we normally operate. We kind of go into this abstract world of, hey, this is about this game, this board. Uh, you need to understand the rules and then maybe form some strategy to uh, beat the opponent. So as you are, I would like you to split into twos. I That's okay. Uh, we are indivisible by two. Uh, so I can play with the one who would be remaining, <laughs> or, or you can be looking into some other uh, person's uh, match. Uh, I really want you guys to play a game of probably, like, the easiest one would be chess or go. This may take some time, right? <laughs> but, and after like 15 minutes or something, I will stop it and say, hey, stop. No one wins, no one loses. And like when playing, think about winning and like trying to make a strategy or something, but also uh, maybe keep in mind what we have been, or like how we have been thinking about problems before in the previous class. So kind of from a programmatic way of how you would program something like this. How, how can you describe uh, the board, for example? In these different games, there are different types of boards, right? So in, in chess and go, there is uh, some some amount of board. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, there are some games which have, the board is something, it, it, it's the, in a hangman, for example, the board is the, the letters that are guessed and not guessed. So uh, from a practical point of view, it would be uh, how do you uh, save it as a state if you are writing the program that would be this game. So think about that, and after the game I will be asking about this. Uh, think about what the action is. So what you are doing is as like one single unit of thing and what the opponent is doing, or the other guy, or the other player. Uh, so yeah, one turn, one action. Uh, and then uh, finally, think how you decide. So with the most possible detail. So uh, kind of think about what makes you make the decision that you are making. Is it like, uh, do you know how to play chess already and you're like memorizing all the turns from previous millions of games and you are like, oh yeah, that's the one I know, this is the most optimal turn. Or is it something like, yeah, so if I do this, the opponent would probably do this, then I could do this, like, I do you like iterate with some depth or like what is the, the procedure that you use for, for making the decision of playing? Or is it completely random? I don't know just at all. I think this is a legal move. Okay, let's try it. Uh, yeah. And so how you would describe this as a strategy? Even more, can you write a program that would do this? Is like, a, don't write it now, but like think about if you could write a program that would be playing chess or playing Go with some strategy. Uh, now it's 15.26, I will give you 15 minutes to play. Uh, so, do we have uh, bears? So there is like one thing that I wanted to talk about games in general is uh, that it's an abstracted world that two people uh, or, or in board games in general, more people can dig into, and then uh, there is a certain like log logical thinking uh, that is defined by a set of rules, and these rules kind of both both players or all players accept these rules and then act in this uh, simplified environment. And uh, that doesn't make much sense. But for example, there is a game called. Wingspan, I think, which is a uh, beautiful board game which has a lot of birds on it, and you start playing it because you care about the birds, and it's amazing because they have uh, like yeah, let's just make this bigger. Uh, if you have some some people in your family who are slightly mad with ornithology, then then like this is what they will give you as a as a present some at some moment, and you start playing this because you want to I don't know collect the Canada goose or something or the uh, I don't know 
or, or you really like the hummingbirds and everything. And, and then slowly over the time you stop, stop seeing the birds, but then you, you don't care about the birds at all. You care about, okay, this is the feather type, uh, or like the, the feather point value is, is large for this one, so I will get this one. I don't care at all about anything else. But like, so, so you just like start, start to losing the reality and move into the abstract uh, <laughs> stuff, which is uh, the actions that these cards can do, or uh, how it fits into your strategy, or how, how many uh, victory points it will give you at the end. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the point I'm trying to kind of make <laughs> Uh, is that these games will uh, allow us to uh, work in an abstract environment in a bit uh, and thinking about strategy in uh, game theory is often like it is very similar to, to some al algorithms you are like trying to get somewhere and you have these building blocks and you want to like put them together in a way that you get there faster and then there is another player who is putting some other blocks and he's trying to get somewhere else faster and then you have to chase him basically. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so I, I was kind of planning first to have a pause here as well, but I think we can maybe carry on and then end a little bit sooner. Uh, so, and it's for now. Uh, throw this class, uh, I am not sure which languages will be used to, to uh, write some of the topics that we are talking about. Uh, I think it would be useful to get back to Python at some point, to just like, have you repeat, use, uh, 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 keep working with it because otherwise you will uh, forget about it and that would be shame. So from that simple point as well. But truth be told, Python is not the best for like graphical uh, interfaces and visualizations. So uh, yeah, there are different tools, and some are uh, some of the uh, the ones are here. So I would like to talk about Wolfram Alpha. Have you any one of you worked with Wolfram Alpha yet? Okay, yeah. So it's a it's a tool which uh, it, it's an advanced calculator at one point. So you can add some some simple stuff, which which is something that you would put into uh, Google Window, and it also will give you that. So I don't know, some really basic formula and it will just calculate for you, easily. Uh, you can use this thing to, to solve these simple equations. I think there is a bunch of examples, so I will just go through them a little bit. There are some algebraic solutions, so you have some uh, equation and then you want to see where, where it solves into zero. So that's something that maybe you have done in, in your high schools or something. This is a thing that you can completely cheat with uh, if you had this in your, your test uh, exams. And so, so uh, yeah, this is the, behind this there is some formula that we have used. And th this is, maybe we can even look at step-by-step -step solution. And with this super simple example, there will be probably yeah, this is just one step, <laughs> but uh, with some more complicated uh, formulas, it's more steps and you can kind of look at every one of them separately and it will kind of help you. Uh, besides uh, just looking at, like, besides just using it as a, as a calculator or smart calculator, there is, uh, it can plot some functions for you, so you can start plotting basically whatever, and that means looking at it as if you were to draw the function in a on a board or something. So let's plot this thing, and how, yeah, this is the, this is the way how it works. You can limit it from 1000 to plus 1000 or something, and then you will look at the, this might take some time. Yeah, so, so you can like check how the function is going. And so practically, how this would be useful is maybe you have some visualization of some, or you are making music somewhere and you want to uh, add this effect uh, over time, but you want it to be slow at start and then come uh, faster up and then come. Yeah, so this is like an inspection tool that you can use to, to see the functions uh, and then use that function to, to multiply the output or whatever of something that you are uh, using. So, 
not just two dimensions, but you can look at things which are in 3D. So how would a uh, landscape of sinusoid and then cosinusoid here, how would it look like? Uh, so something like this. Uh, so th this is like a landscape of this, uh, of this function. Uh, so in theory, you could use this uh, function to generate the terrain in some game, and it would look like this. Uh, and you can look at the contours or something, which means that it will not show the 3D view, but the, the lines where all the height is the same. Uh, let's see. You can kind of play around with it and then find the one which is which starts breaking it. Yeah, so this, this is a strange thing suddenly. Uh, other way how to use this uh, is uh, besides plotting and solving some basic formulas is uh, that it works like an encyclopedia. So there are, there are things that you can search for and it will give you answers for them. And I don't know, do you know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Any one of you? Okay. So th there is an idea that there is a universal guide that has answer to everything, sort of, and you can just type something and it will give you answer to that and there is a description of, I don't know, planet Earth, relatively harmless or something is the, 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 the entry there. So this works similarly, uh, that you can uh, look at the information of the film Goodfellas, for example, and then if you just input Goodfellas, it will give you some information here. So it, it's like smarter Google a little bit. I think it, it will get these information from somewhere, from some Wikipedia probably, but these are some stats. Uh, or, I don't know, yeah, movies starring Kevin Bacon and Tom Cruise. There are some examples of, of like searches that some other people did. And yeah, there is just one film with it. Um, or you can yeah, compare some things and just get the stats there. Yeah. So, so what this is really useful as is probably the plotting tool. So you can plot the 3D surface of a function that you don't know uh, how it looks like first at first. And this works even for like some really complicated functions because it has a lot of them just stored and saved and you don't need anything installed on your PC it will, because it just does it online. Uh, there are a lot of tools like this called Maple, uh, Wolfram us as well, which are uh, really expensive tools uh, that you can buy as a software and then it's some like an analytical solver for some problem that you have. And yeah, you, you might come, uh, you, you have, uh, maybe you can describe like something that's happening in real world with these formulas and then you will use some tool like this to get the, where, where the function is maximal and then you can use these as a, well, <laughs> uh, you can use those, uh, these tools to kind of give you the optimal values for that. Right. Uh, so that's Wolfram. Uh, Another one which is a bit more visual is uh, GeoGebra. I don't know, do you know GeoGebra, anyone? Okay, perfect. Uh, and so, sorry, this is in Czech, but we can like go through it fast. This is a tool to kind of, uh, uh, to, uh, to work with geometry on a virtual board of this, of GeoGebra. Gebra. And so often there is like a, a tool, uh, like a, these are some demos where, where you can like move with the points and it will, uh, it will show you the visualization of what is where and you can kind of drag around things. And so uh, this is one case where you can just load some demo, but uh, you can also work with your own stuff. So yeah, there's some more complicated demo about ellipses. And this is showing like where are the angles which have a uh, right angle or something. Maybe you can even drag with this. Maybe not. So this is visualization of some. Yeah, this one doesn't seem to be movable really. 
Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, you can also use it uh, when when working with some problem of your own, and then just drawing it into in this program in the software, and then uh, yeah, visualizing whatever you need with this. Uh, yeah. So that's GeoGebra. Um, and these are online demos, but uh, there is one for um, as, as an offline version where you can just use it as a, as a regular tool. And the last one, or oh, yeah, la last class we also talked about uh, Google Collab, uh, which is the we have used it to, to run some of the demos online. But uh, the advantage is that uh, it's accessing a machine with a powerful GPU, so you can quite often use it with some. I don't know, machine learning demos or something. So I don't have anything exactly here, but that's a way how to maybe showcase your work if you have done something with that. And then uh, a last two, one is the GASP gallery. I randomly found this a few days ago, uh, which is just, uh, I should maybe kill all of these windows. And this is a web page with a bunch of generative algorithms, uh, which are making some art, basically, some pattern. And then you can quite often like open the uh, the sketch or the uh, like algorithm, and then just drag and play with whatever they made. And I, I think the the trick is that eventually you can buy it as well or something. But this is, yeah, you can completely break whatever it lo looked like. Um, so maybe this is something that we would eventually get to uh, in this class as well. So it is using some mathematical formulation to then create some pattern or some uh, texture maybe. Uh, And there is like a lot of these there, but they are using some. Quite often, they are using some basic rules and then uh, having it on like a larger uh, board, so it looks nicer. And then last one would be uh, the P five JS demos. I don't know. You have had the class about P five. Uh, P five, right? Okay. Have you uh, worked with the book uh, Generative Design before? Mm, okay. Yeah. So, so the book is full of these kind of like just showcasing demos. Basically, it's very similar to this site uh, before, but maybe more uh, narrated in the book on one hand, and then kind of going through the simple sketches into some more complicated uh, examples. Yeah, and I think in this case you can also eventually open it up and then just change the code and see whatever happens with it. Okay, and so the task now uh, is to go through these demos and maybe pick one and then just play around with it, uh, and that is, will be the end of the class for today.